so much for joining me on the podcast. I'm excited to talk with you about your journey to becoming the CEO of Cerebral. And also, uh, you, you've got a really interesting journey just in digital health in general. And I think a lot of us are curious about how you got in there. So welcome to the show. Uh, glad to have you on and uh, would love if you could introduce yourself to our audience and, and, and tell us a little bit about your background and, uh, and all of that. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Uh, yes, my name is uh, uh, David Mo. I'm a, a psychiatrist uh, by training and a serial entrepreneur. Uh, Cerebral is my third startup. Um, my background is, uh, frankly, kind of weird. So I am a, a data science by training. So I'm a psychiatrist uh, who did a postdoc in data science on how to predict suicidal behaviors. And it was very fascinating to me because it really revealed to me how little data uh, that mental health professionals use on a large scale. And so we were trying to predict and then prevent suicidal thoughts and behaviors in patients who are at high risk. Um, and then uh, you know, uh, in parallel, I've been starting companies. I started my first uh, VC-backed company while I was in med school. And then during residency, started a telepsychiatry company. It's Cerebral, joined Cerebral about a year and 10 months ago now um, as chief medical officer. And more recently, a few months ago, became the CEO. Very cool. So <laughs> I'm very curious. How did you start a company while you were in medical school that was VC backed? And how did you even manage to do that? Yeah, you know, it was uh, uh, it was hard <laughs> is the short of it. Um, but it was, uh, you know, I think it's always interesting. I actually find it to be really reinvigorating uh, to be starting something on the venture side in the startup side while you're doing clinical work. And uh, so that was the same during medical school. It was the same during residency as well, uh, because medicine is tends to be very data-driven, rigorous, but slow. And so you find these problems that are happening. And then on the venture side, things are very fast and you're able to you know, go from bench to bedside, so to speak, very, very quickly. Right. So there was uh, the two were actually very complimentary, but I'm not going to lie. Uh, th there were a lot of nights where I s had very little sleep and uh, uh, it, it was uh, there was a lot of pain involved in all of that. <laughs> so were you were you were you an operator of the company while you were while you were in school? Because you you're not only were you at med school in med school, but you were at Harvard Medical School, which is like I imagine exceptionally rigorous. Yeah, so for my first company, I was CEO, and for the second company, when I did residency, I was a co-founder, chief medical officer, and eventually president. So, uh, yeah, it was definitely operating. Um, and again, I think there's a lot of common denominators between what you're trying to do. So, uh, for example, uh, the telepsychiatry company that I started uh, depended a lot on the data science that I was learning during residency, during my training as well as a postdoc. So there were common denominators. These weren't uh, completely uh, different enterprises. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so um, you, you, you've you had these significant experiences throughout your training. Uh, after residency training, you started a company. Was this Vera Health? Was this the one you started during your residency? Yeah, I started Valera right before Valera, residency. Sorry. I did um, my uh, MD MBA at Harvard, so it's a joint uh, degree between Harvard Business School and Harvard Medical School, and that's when the idea came to be, and we launched um, and ran that company throughout uh, my residency. Very cool. What have you learned? I mean, what 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 benefit do you see as being you know having that clinical experience as a psychiatrist, but also uh, having that experience as a, as a data scientist and also as an entrepreneur, you know, as a, as someone who's founded a company, how do those three things come together for you? Yeah, it's a good question. Well, first of all, I should just say that healthcare startups, you have to have strong clinical leadership. Um, that is a prerequisite. I think it's very presumptive and hubris driven if, People from tech comes or come into healthcare and try to change things as if these things haven't happened before, right? So that is very, very important to have that clinical background uh, to really appreciate why healthcare is a conservative enterprise uh, to begin with. When you're thinking about tech startups, they can uh, grow, they can die, and at the end of the day, what you lose are followers and people can go to a different platform. When we're talking about healthcare, 
the well-being of patients are at stake, the lives of patients are at stake. So there's a necessarily a conservative uh, spirit about the healthcare industry um, that needs to be respected. And uh, so one major piece here is having strong clinical leadership, strong clinician voices is really, really important. Now, on the other side of this, I would argue that uh, startups are very good at bringing new streams of data, new types of interactions, uh, innovating new ways of engaging patients that healthcare has been more sclerotic and less uh, open to, to the detriment of patients, right? So how can you take uh, what I like to call the rigor of medicine and combine that with the speed of entrepreneurship is, is something that can really be critical in moving healthcare forward. So that's what I'm really excited by, how to combine the best pieces of both spheres uh, to move healthcare forward. Awesome. So I'm, I'm curious, what led you to joining Cerebral? How did you get into that sphere? How did you get connected? And like, what was your jump going into Cerebral? Yeah, my former CEO called me. And at that time, I had very little interest in leaving my last company, which I founded, and we just raised around things were going really well. And what was unique about Cerebral is uh, the scale and the operational excellence. Um, it was the fastest growing healthcare company ever and uh, was treating patients in all 50 states. Today, we have touched more than 500,000 lives uh, and improved care uh, for many of these patients uh, across the country. And so it felt like a really unique opportunity and that's exactly what it was. Excellent. So it was someone that you had previously worked with in some capacity that kind of opened up that door for you? Uh, not even. I actually did not know my former uh, uh, CEO uh, prior to uh, this. So it was uh, uh, the opportunity presented itself. And, you know, one thing that I found to be particularly unique is that Cerebral has its own electronic uh, medical record system. So our own EMR and our own patient engagement platform. And so what attracted me in large ways was as a data scientist, I said, wow, now we have all of this data housed in one infrastructure, we can begin to use this data really, really well. And so happy to talk through a little bit about that as well. But when we own our EMR, when we have everything within the same data lake, so we have patient information and we have their medications, what dosages, how many refills, we have their lab data, we have uh, how suicidal they are, right? Their PHQ-9s and their validated you know, PROM scores, uh, and patient reported outcomes. Um, once you have that all housed together in one place, you can begin to empower your clinicians to use that data in a way that you never could if you took an off-the-shelf EMR and bolted that onto your clinical services. And that's one one major piece that attracted me to uh, to the opportunity. Very cool. And so you started off as, as, as Cerebral as a chief medical officer. What did your role initially as chief medical officer involve uh, in the early stages of the company? Yeah, the first thing was to bring clinical quality, clinical safety uh, into the forefront. And we created uh, two departments, uh, separate departments, one a department of clinical safety, another one of clinical uh, quality, each run by their independent psychiatrist. And I'm proud to say that uh, we have one of the most robust clinical quality and safety programs of any uh, telehealth uh, clinic uh, out there. Um, and uh, each one of them has one mission and one mission only to make care safer, to make it higher quality. Excellent. Um, anything unique that you've learned in this process? I know that during the pandemic, there's been just, you know, uh, so many patients that have suffered from mental illness and, you know, it's really exacerbated, exacerbated the mental health crisis in this country. Um, anything particular that you've picked up on or learned uh, over the last maybe two or three years? Yeah, this is uh, really important. Cerebral is democratizing access to high quality mental health care. And it's really important to know that it's not just for the coastal elites. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, two thirds of our patients have never had the privilege of accessing mental health care prior to cerebral, meaning this is the first time they're accessing mental health care, right? Mm -hmm. The other fact that's really worth noting is that um, most of our patients actually make salaries below the national average. 
right? So this is not just about helping out wealthy coastal elites uh, get access to their mental health care. These are people who historically have just not gotten care and were democratizing care to them, right? I'll give you a, a, a true a case example of this. We had a patient who used to get his therapy uh, sessions while he was in his truck. And at some point we asked him, we said, uh, is there a reason that you're in your truck when you're getting your care? And he paused for a second and he said, well, I'm not ready to tell my wife or my kids that I'm seeking mental health care. And also at the office, I don't have a private office. I, uh, I don't make enough money to have a private office. And so you need to meet me where I am. And I appreciate that, right? Which is going to be me in my car uh, because I'm tired of meeting doctors where they are. And that's what I've done my entire life. Go to the office, go to their uh, uh, office and uh, wait uh, among other patients. And when the doctor's ready to see me, then I go see them, right? So the idea here is that we have to begin to meet patients where they are, especially in mental health. Yeah. Um, and it's really interesting that you say that because a lot of these direct to consumer companies, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't know if you'd call it direct to consumer or direct to patient, but a lot are focused on maybe a wealthier class of individuals. Um, whereas cerebrals seems to have taken a, a sort of opposite approach. Yeah. I, I would just say that millions of Americans are suffering and they've historically just not have not gotten the access, right? So on average, when you try to look for a psychiatrist, the average wait time is months before you can get uh -huh. care. This is even if you have insurance, right? The experience is excruciating. Uh, what, what people end up doing is you go to the directory and on average, there are studies on this. You have to call seven or 10 different offices before you get your first appointment. That would happen months from now. That's not helpful. you know. And if this were about cancer care or diabetes care, we wouldn't accept it. And we shouldn't tolerate it uh, mm -hmm. because it's mental health. Right. If if you could, you know, summarize cerebr your goal, pers your personal goal for mental health care, for the problem you have the ability to potentially solve in this country, what would be your like big number one goal you'd like to solve with, with Cerebral? People deserve a high quality of mental health care and they shouldn't have to suffer in silence. And so our goal really is to democratize access across all 50 states for millions of Americans. We want to be able to not only work with those who can afford the subscription, but we want to also provide care for those who have insurance as well. So we work closely with insurance companies. We have over 60 million lives under coverage right now. We hope that becomes 300 million, the entirety of the population in the near future. Um, and uh, that way we can make sure that mental health is a right and something that people uh, can have easy access to whenever they need it. Yeah. Um, I can think back to a few times in my training where, you know, I was working in the ER and uh, the ER was filled with with um, who had been either um, having suicidal ideation or had a suicide attempt, and or uh, some other uh, mental mental health illness that they were being brought in for, um, and they'd end up sometimes sitting in the ER for like four days, five days, sometimes two weeks in the most extreme cases, um, and wouldn't have a psychiatrist to see them. Uh, how is, is Cerebral in any way helping address the issue of maybe catching or treating and diagnosing mental health illnesses at an earlier stage, especially in some of these vulnerable populations? Yeah, it's a really good question. So just take that example and see what the negative ramifications of that are, right? Let's say you're in your suicidal and your first foray, your first interaction with the mental health care system is that you're locked in the emergency room for days on end without real treatment while you're waiting for a bed. Uh, That's terrible. That really is terrible, right? It really tells you, I don't want to seek mental health. So um, that's terrible for the patient, terrible for the family members. It's also terrible for the insurance companies. That emergency room visit costs thousands and thousands of dollars, right? So how can you go upstream and provide patients with outpatient care, preventative mental health care ahead of time? To your point, that's exactly the thesis here, right? So we take on patients um, 
who have uh, thoughts of hurting themselves, who have suicidal ideation. We're one of the very few uh, clinics that does that. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, there are many patients who come to us and they say, you know, I used to work with a therapist in so-and-so service, right, some telehealth company, uh, and then I disclosed that I had a history of suicidal thinking and they read me some legalese and they dumped me. They basically stopped treating me immediately because of legal risk, right? Well, we think that's not the right thing to do. And so we take on these patients. We have a very robust clinical safety program so that we can make sure that they're safe. Um, but these are the patients who need the care the most. And frankly, and I can say this as a mental health professional myself, our field has had incentives to not take care of these patients, the ones who need the care the most, right? And I'll give you the reason why. You get paid the same amount taking care of a wealthy, worried, well patient as you do someone with suicidal ideation who might call you at three in the morning or page you at four in the morning. So why would pay, why would clinicians take on a higher risk panel? And there's a, a, a unfortunate situation with among psychiatrists where uh, you know you don't want to take on these high risk patients. So if you have a friend or a family member who's suffering from this, there's a little bit of a horse trading behind the scenes, right? And so this is the perverse incentives that are happening behind a fee for service mental health world. Right. How do we break free of this? How do we uh, how, how can we uh, do that? This is a major thesis of what we're trying to do at Cerebral, which is to A, show, bring on these patients, take very good care of them, and B, show the insurance companies that we're doing that. We're preventing unnecessary emergency room visits and hospitalizations and therefore saving them money and C, get to value-based care collectively uh, with, uh, mm -hmm. with those entities. Yeah, that's an interesting point that you bring up with sort of the legal risk and like taking on higher risk patients, because this is something that's sort of been ingrained in us even throughout our training. Um, it's, in, you know, it's obvious with uh, things like opioids and uh, pain medications. I think a lot of people are scared. I think a lot of uh, provide prescribers are scared to prescribe certain medicate controlled medications uh, because of, you know, obviously the risks that are involved. And then I think there's not a lot of clarity on how to navigate that. And so it, from what you've said, is that is that part of part of the mission is to like maybe create some transparency or create, pro, you know, these set guidelines and protocols for these higher risk uh, evaluations or visits so that things are more standardized and maybe uh, takes a little bit of the fear out of that process? Yeah, the solution here in my mind is to empower our clinicians with the best data to make, to surround their clients, their patients with the best uh, safety net protection system. So here are the many things that we do that I think are quite unique. First of all, um, I believe we're the only clinic that actually pays our clinicians extra to call suicidal patients in between visits. So there's research to show that if you get in touch with your patients who are suicidal in between visits, not during official visits, right, just to check in on them, it actually decreases their risk for having a suicide attempt, right? We looked at the research. We talked to our advisor, who's the chair of psychology at, at, um, at Harvard. Um, Matt Nock is his name. He's, a, he's a, a renowned suicide researcher. And we said, let's just do that. Let's just pay these clinicians more to incentivize to do the right thing here. Right. And so we, we do that and we've been able to demonstrate that doing so basically connects patients to care faster and they actually get follow up appointments faster after after these outreaches. Right. That's one piece. Another piece that I'm really proud of is that we are using machine learning to detect suicidality within text messages. So every day we get thousands and thousands of messages through the cerebral platform and we're able to now use machine learning to detect which of those messages has suicidal content within them with 99% accuracy. We can know that now. And not only do we say, oh, just call 911 We don't, uh, you know, that's certainly there. We actually do proactive outreach. So within seven minutes of getting that text message, we, our crisis response uh, specialists, which is our own, would reach out within seven minutes to call the patient to make sure that everything's okay and do a safety planning uh, or help with uh, a coping strategies as need be. And that service is available to our patients 24 seven. Um, I don't know of another uh, clinic that does something like this, but to answer your question, the idea here is to surround our, 
our clinicians and our patients with as much support as possible so they feel comfortable taking care of patients with uh-huh. suicidal thoughts and behaviors. I love that. Um, David, I'm curious, like what, what drives you? What is it that inspires you to, to pursue this? Because it seems like you're passionate about this. You care about these patients. You care about making a difference. What is it that's driving you? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So I can psychoanalyze myself a little bit here. Uh, I've had, I've always had uh, friends uh, and family members who dealt with mental illnesses and seeing the devastation this puts on them, their family members, and seeing that the current system has failed them so, so conclusively is more than enough reason for me to, to want to do something about it. Um, and the sad thing here is that we do have effective treatments, therapy, medications. We do have effective therapy. It's about the implementation and getting these therapies out uh, to the patients where we really have uh, messed up. And so, and when I say we, I mean us as the mental health community. And so uh, there's just so much suffering that could be addressed that isn't because the system is so broken. Um, that's what really drives me. I'm happy to share a, a, a you know, a, a personal story about this. One of my friends recently uh, took her own life and this was very challenging of course, for family members and friends. And this was someone who was privileged, who worked in the startup space, who, even though I was a psychiatrist, didn't tell me about her struggles, right? So makes me think, what do we need to do so that she could have access care that was stigma-free, that she didn't have to talk to her doctor friends in order to get to a psychiatrist? Um, What could we have done different? Uh, in order to save people like her, um, there's just so much to be done. And so to me, this is very much a mission. You know, I tell my team all the time, to me, this is much more than a job. This is a sacred mission that we're all on together. And we we need to get this right. This is not to, uh, this is not something that we can uh, we can ignore. Um, you know, they say that the banks are sometimes too big to fail. Well, this for us, I think this is too critical to fail uh, in my mind. Yeah. Do you think there's any uh, foundational, because, you know, sometimes we think that with mental health, uh, it's or, or even suicidality, it's, you know, seeking care, or talking to someone or getting a or getting treatment is, is going to fix the issue. Do you feel like there's anything that's even more fundamental that we haven't been able it's like a societal change or something that's happening culturally here in America that's leading to a lot of these problems that we're not able to just fix with a patient visit or with medication. I was going to say, you know, for doctors, maybe, you know, there's the pressure that they feel of like, you know, working a high pressure job and being stuck and all these other things that lead to physician suicide, right? And, and, and physicians, you know, we're, we've trained. We know. We know what we need to do. We know what we're supposed to do. We know we're supposed to talk to someone and get help. We don't. We don't do those things. But uh, you know, like I think that, that there's a lot of people in that category. Like they have access to care. They have medications. Um, they're still not in a good spot. Yeah, I think it's a big question, and th- there's so much to be said here. So first of all, I would say that our current environment is very high stress. Right, capitalism itself makes you compare yourself to other people, and there's always this rat race, and it's always going to be stressful. And if you're not stressed, then something's wrong. If you're not working, then what's wrong? Right. So there's always this uh, this inex- inexorable wave to do more uh, and be more efficient and be more accomplished. As soon as you hit a certain rung, there are five more rungs that you can uh, uh, see above that. And that's not helpful. I, that's definitely not helpful. And there's a certain level of stress where it becomes pathological, right? So um, I would say definitely society has a lot to do with that. And the solution for that isn't that you solve it with a medication or whatnot. It's the idea is that, well, how do we cope with these challenges, right? With this, the stress, with the depression that may come with burnout and things along those lines. And that in order to deal with that, it's a combination of potentially of therapy um, plus medications and or medications. And um, we have to have that self-awareness to get there, right? So you brought up doctors, 
I think doctors are actually very good at treating other people, but we're pretty terrible at treating ourselves, right? Our risk of suicide is many times that of the average uh, American. Our risk of alcohol uh, use disorders is many times uh, uh, the, the national average. It's a stressful job. But I also think that we don't see ourselves as patients very often. And a lot of what good mental health care and good mental health hygiene in general is, is self-awareness, just being aware at, uh, about when hey, we're coming, we're not doing our well ourselves and we do need to seek care uh, for ourselves as well. It's that old saying that, you know, on the plane, you have to place the oxygen mask on yourself before you help others. Uh, sometimes we're very blind to that. And that's very typical of physicians as well as other professionals. Yeah, I can totally agree with that. Um, as far as like the future of mental health care, where do you see things going, uh, especially now with this whole uh, evolution of digital health? There's a mental health companies popping up every 10 minutes. Um, do you see do you see mental health care becoming a, a, a very virtual process? Yeah, I th- I'll say a couple of things about this. First of all, I think it's going to be a hybrid at the end of the day. Because some people will prefer in person, others, the majority, I believe, will prefer virtual. And people who can move seamlessly between the two will be um, uh, the clinics that are able to do that seamlessly will be the winners in my uh, in my view. Now that could be through partnerships, it could be through other different mechanisms, but I think that will be uh, the idea. And keep in mind that there are some uh, interventions uh, for mental health that do require in person care, right? So um, I'm happy to chat about that. The other major thing I think is going to be measurement science, right? So let me give you a stat that I think is usually jarring for doctors to hear. Um, Over 80% of mental health professionals don't measure any outcomes whatsoever, right? If you think about that, you would never accept that if this were your diabetes doctor. So your endocrinologist, let's say they just didn't measure your hemoglobin one A1C, or they just didn't measure your blood sugar, you would say, well, that's not okay. I, I want a new doctor, right? If this were your cardiologist and you had CHF, if they never measured your labs, you would say, wait a minute, this is not okay. I, I want a new doctor. But somehow in psychiatry, it's a data-free zone as my mentor, Tom Intel likes to talk about it, right? That's not okay. That really isn't okay, and we need to change that. What I think will happen is that telehealth companies, and I would say telehealth to begin with, because telehealth allows you to measure a lot of these outcomes. It's much easier to get them an automatic PHQ-9 before they jump on their telehealth visit, right? because it's within the same software. Telehealth companies are going to begin to measure these outcomes, and these standards will be created. Right. So there will eventually be a hemoglobin A1C of behavioral health for depression. Right. There will be a, a blood sugar level for bipolar disorder, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, the analogous metrics right for that. Just to uh, interject here, will these be a labs like uh, objective data or will these be like um, subjective uh, inputs from patients that culminate into a it's score? It's a good question. I think both will be true. Right. So right now, our gold standards are really asking the patients, right? How are you feeling? Uh, giving them a validated survey for depression like the PHQ-9, right? But very closely, we can begin to measure other things as well. So for example, we have uh, so certain medications that you put patients on for bipolar disorder require regular lab monitoring, right? So if you put a patient on lithium, they need regular lab monitoring. Well, are they getting that or not? You know, go around and ask any clinic. Their number one answer for you will be, oh, we have no idea whether whether they're getting (laughs) We just don't monitor that. Well, we do, right? And 97%, we basically bother these clinicians until they order the labs, until they get it right. There's no excuse for not getting it right, right? So digital health allows you to to bring in that level of, um, I would say, both measuring but also intervention on the other side in order to make sure that that metric is, is optimized for, right? So, you know, going back to the idea here that we want to eventually come up with a hemoglobin A1C for depression, right? That's just the beginning, right? Let's say that's patient reported. Let me give you more of a futuristic view of what that may look like. Let's say uh, in a year or so, this doesn't have to take long, we can begin to measure the voice, the tone of patients and correlate that with their mood, right? Let's say we're able to measure their facial features and correlate that with the side effects of their medications. That can be quantified, 
in a way that you would never be able to do uh, uh, for in-person visits, right? So there are many ways in which telehealth can revolutionize you know, the, the, the data aspect for behavioral health. And that's why I'm so optimistic about uh, what uh, mm-hmm. what Cerebral has in store for the near future. Yeah. Do you feel like those will be some kind, kind of uh, our AI in a, in a, AI integration that can maybe look at someone's face or pick up on these cues that help with Absolutely. diagnosing? And so you treating. can imagine that because we have large volumes of patients and we have large volumes of data inputs, we can begin to use a lot of this data to predict when patients are going to get better, when patients are going to get worse, maybe which medication will be best for this specific type of patient based on data, right? If you think about it, Mm -hmm. Google and Facebook are very good at using big data to figure out what are you going to buy next? What are you going to click on next, right? Why can't we use the same principles and use it for good and help people in their mental health journey? And the answer I think is we can, we just need to be able to do it. Yeah. Where do, where does, where does technology and the human touch meet? Because I think that there's obviously there's the relationship component between patient and, and doctor or clinician, um, which, which obviously brings a level of comfort, especially for patients that get the continuity of care. Um, where does that meet with technology? Do you think that that, that relationship component, that human touch component will, will still be essential? to mental health care delivery? Yeah, good question. So my take on this is that that human touch will always be important. Mental health care will always be about relationships. Now, there is something really beautiful about telehealth, which is that uh, there's plenty of studies and meta-analyses to show that telehealth, and specifically in behavioral health, is not inferior to in-person care. And that is not true for any other specialty. And that makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, you as an emergency medicine doc or a primary care doc, you can't do a physical exam. So of course, there's no way to compare virtual versus in-person for many other specialties. However, for right. telehealth and behavioral health, um, that in psychiatry, there's no difference uh, whatsoever. And that I think is really, really powerful. Um, as a matter of fact, I would argue that telehealth in many ways it, it can be better because no-show rates uh, decrease dramatically, number one. And number two, you can you can begin to innovate around the type of uh, interactions you have with the patient. And let me explain that uh, for a second. So let's say you know you I, I might ask you therapy, right? Talk therapy, an hour a week, and that's what it's been doing for. Uh, that's what how it's been defined for decades. Uh, why is it that way? How do we know that let's say fifteen minutes every other day isn't as good, I'm making this up, right? Maybe that's better, mm-hmm. yeah, higher touch, lower frequency. Well, the reality is that in brick and mortar practice, it's just not practical for someone to come in 15 minutes every other day, right? However, right. telehealth <laughs> allows that, that level of interaction, right? So now we can yeah. begin to innovate along multiple different uh, dimensions and take away some of the basic assumptions that we've had about behavioral health and and really think more broadly about what really drives better clinical outcomes for our patients, right? So this is why I'm so excited about what digital yeah. health can do for mental health specifically. That's a really interesting concept because I think that loneliness is a big part of mental health uh, uh, illness for a lot of patients because they just don't have anyone to talk to, uh, feel secluded, um, and, uh, but, you know, that's a good point. Maybe that higher touch, you know, every other day kind of, comp- I, I would love to see data around that or just love to see like a comparison study of like, you know, hour long t- talk therapy every other week versus these higher, like shorter, higher touch, uh, therapy sessions, maybe to process trauma. I guess you really need to tell your story and you need time to go through it, but maybe like from a, from a different perspective, the loneliness or, support element that like a more frequent visits gives can can bring value in a different way yeah i mean i think this is the this is another piece of the data uh and behavioral health piece right which is that for depending to your point depending on your presenting problem and your diagnosis the rhythm and the cadence of follow-ups the type of intervention should be different we should be thinking about this like we have for precision medicine Right. There should be precision psychiatry as well. 
right? So of course it should be different whether you're coming in for anxiety disorder, social anxiety versus let's say you're coming in because you were traumatized recently, right? And so uh, of course it shouldn't be the same cadence, which is by the way, the, the case for most of mental health today, right? So, but without that data, if you don't have the data, you can't get to precision. So we really have to hit the precision, uh, sorry, the data piece first before we can we can actually get there. Uh, I'll have another story about this, which I think is uh, just gives you a sense. You know, a lot of people say that you can't treat patients with serious mental illnesses with uh, 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 with telehealth. It's, it's just simply not true. Um, I used to supervise this case where this patient was in and out of hospitals for a psychotic disorder and uh, would go around the country too. So take a flight to a different city and get hospitalized there. And initially we just kept, we did not give up. We just kept on calling her, kept on calling her. And eventually what we realized is that she really didn't like to be on video calls, but she was very willing to jump on the phone call with us. And now it became very helpful because now every time she's in the emergency room, she would just hand the phone and call this number and then hand it over uh, to uh, to uh, the emergency room doctor or the inpatient doctor. And eventually we were able to decrease her emergency room visits by a lot, right? And, you know, the other story- This uh, is a cerebral story, patient? This is a, a former patient at my last company uh, be before Cerebral, but it shows the principle that we can definitely take care of patients with serious mental illnesses by through a telehealth uh, platform. You know, and the other piece of this that was really interesting is that she started calling when she was filling out her Medicaid forms. She started calling when she was at her interview for uh, for a low income housing, but she got nervous, and so she used us uh, uh, through that resource. But that's perfectly fine. That's redefining what behavioral health is, because if we could get her housing, if we can get her uh, her insurance back uh, through Medicaid, that would be the that would be what changes her life, right? So I would just say that telehealth allows for multiple modalities here and it helps us rethink what our actual role is here and makes uh, hopefully it makes us less rigid in thinking through exactly what would be valuable to the patient at the end of the day. Absolutely, yeah. Um, these are all excellent points, and I, you know, I'm actually really inspired by uh, all the different things you've been doing for patients and and how you're helping patients. I do want to switch gears a little bit and give you an opportunity to address something maybe on you know that that's been brought up before. Um, obviously, uh, Cerebral has faced some criticism in the recent months, and um, I just would love to hear from your perspective how you've handled that and um, how you're, you know, how you're responding to a lot of the criticism that has come up. Yeah, it really, we've been uh, getting an unfair shake by the press. And so from the get go, you know, when I came here, we started measuring clinical outcomes at a very, very uh, detailed level. Um, as a matter of fact, we share those outcomes with the insurance partners that we work with, right? So they're actually fully aware of uh, uh, how we're able to deliver high quality care. So the average wait time is usually two to five days at most. Uh, again, compared with months at your typical clinic, we measure outcomes in terms of depression, anxiety and whatnot. And so we will continue to do that. And I would just say we would double down on the quality efforts. Uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, a dedicated clinical quality department, dedicated clinical safety department. We've published a lot of those protocols and we, we invite others to do the same. Because I, I really think that it's it's easy to criticize, uh, but at the end of the day, we do we do do what top clinics do, which is measure these outcomes. We have incident reporting systems. We have a a, a monthly M and M conference, which is usually uh, you know I took that from Mass General Hospital, and all academic medical centers have something of those processes. So the idea here is that we're really trying to become. Uh, best in class across the board in terms of quality and safety. And the only way that we could get that across uh, is to continue to do that, to double down on those efforts, uh, to publish in peer-reviewed uh, journals as well, which we're certainly prioritizing in the coming coming months. Yeah. Um, I, I'm curious, how have you personally handled the criticism? Because I've seen, you know, we've been in some chats together in the, in the, in the groups we're in and, and, um, you know, obviously some people, you know, you know, just read a headline and maybe just put some copy and paste and 
don't really look at the bigger, broader picture. And you posted a response one time that I thought was brilliant. Um, I don't. I, I wish I had pulled it up before so that I could read it. But um, something along the lines of innovation uh, taking time and uh, requiring trial and a, a trial, and to some degree, there's going to be error, um, and and then uh, re recalibrating. And uh, would just love for you to speak on that on that on that note and how, and how you're you know handling some of the criticism. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think the number one thing we have to keep in mind and the number one thing I tell my team all the time is that if you focus on the patient, if you do everything for the patient, you can't go wrong. At any point uh, where we have to be as patient focused, as client focused as possible, and nothing we do can be at the expense of our of our patients. So that's really having a strong North Star there is important. The second piece here, um, to your point, is that to innovate or to do anything in healthcare, you have to have a healthy dose of humility. And absolutely, we're going to learn things. We're going to make mistakes. We have to be honest about that. And then we have to get better based on that, right? So for example, the fact that no one measures any outcomes uh, at all for um, uh, for uh, let's say what percentage of your bipolar patients are on a mood stabilizer, which is first line treatment. Well, we're going to measure that, and we're going to realize that some patients aren't on those medications and they're unstable. Well, that's we got to get better. At that. How do we in, inform our, teach our clinicians, train them so that they can better talk about these medications? How can we better understand the side effect profiles and better match patients with the right medications at the get go? So there's less of a trial error piece, which is endemic in mental health care, right? So by measuring, you're going to find things, right? And that should not be a reason to not measure. It should be the fire to improve on those uh, metrics and get to better care, right? So I think the combination between uh, really focusing on the patient, doing everything for, for the patient, um, uh, while also having the humility to understand that we're going to continue to learn is going to be uh, uh, really important going forward. Um, you know, the last thing I'll say here about that specific piece is stigma is alive and well, right? You know, I think uh, uh, you asked how does this affect me personally? It, it, I'll tell you, the, the comments that hurt me the most uh, on our reviews are people who, let's say, not, are not using our services, and, and they'll say something along the lines of, walk it off. You could just walk it off. Uh, my father was so strong, he didn't blah, 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 and he didn't need mental health care, and he had a harder life than you guys, so walk it off. That sort of demeaning of the patient and the fact that they have to seek care, uh, to me, is the most toxic of all of this. But behind a lot of, I think, what's going on is that stigma, which is to somehow suggest that, hey, you are weak for seeking mental health care. And I think that's particularly pernicious and really dangerous. And I actually think some journalists per uh, perpetuate this unknowingly by, mm -hmm. um, by writing about this in a way where it's like, okay, but they didn't need this, right? People don't actually need this, right? They could just, they could just walk it off. If I just exercise or ate right, they wouldn't be severely depressed. They wouldn't be suicidal, which is, mm -hmm. you, you know, if you were a suicidal patient, nothing could be more invalidating. Right. So I think there are cultural movements about this as well that are challenging. Um, there are some movements which are positive, but uh, overall, the stigma against seeking mental health care is, is still a very, very serious one. Yeah. Um, thank you for that, David. I'm also curious, how do you how do you personally respond to like people that are skeptics or people that maybe say things that are hurtful um, or about whatever, or about the practices, like, how do you personally respond to them? Because clearly you believe in this and you're passionate about this. And there's always, you know, there's, you know, there's always people that read a headline or um, just run with a story that they're told, maybe there's more to it, maybe there's not. But I'm just curious how, what your response are to like really heavy skeptics or, or people who are heavily, heavily critical. Yeah. You know, I think the best thing is to give them the facts, right? So, and we have right so um and it's um i think one day i hopefully they will listen and the idea here is that we have really good outcomes data and at the aggregate level if you look at what's actually going on 
uh, the outcomes are great. We're getting patients to care and people are feeling better afterwards, right? We, you know, in tens and uh, I forgot how many reviews now we have, but we're a 4.7 star out of a five uh, on the uh, Apple app store. So you have to re- be able to reconcile that, Hey, look, uh, there are these anecdotes and then there's reality of where things are. Um, and right. so uh, I think the data will eventually speak uh, the loudest. I hope that, you know, this is another, you know, to pull back for a second, you might ask, well, why is psychiatry so disrespected? I would actually say a big part of that is that we don't use data, right? So when, you know, when you're talking about, let's say, let's take infectious disease, uh, for example, right? There's a very clear algorithm. You do this and then you take an antibiotic or you don't take an antibiotic. And if you do, your symptoms go away within 24 hours or 48 hours. There's a very clear metric driven algorithm that leads to an outcome that we can all agree is good, right? But if psychiatry and mental health in general is a data-free zone and we don't measure that, then it becomes fluffy. That gets perceived as fluffy. We rightfully deserve that reputation, right? So then how do we change that? How do we bring data back into this space by measuring outcomes? And if let's say in a year or two, I can say, okay, for John Doe, because of his presenting symptoms and given his background and his last uh, response to Selexa, I think bupropion is the best medication for him. And that results in faster relapse of his, uh, sorry, f- faster remission of his depression. We become closer in, uh, to the cardiologies in the infectious diseases, right? So as much as I you know, uh, want us to move in that direction, I also acknowledge the fact that we have to be more rigorous as a field in order to gain that respect from, from others. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I guess uh, uh, my final question would be uh, in your transition to CEO now, uh, how has your role changed in terms of leadership in the company and decision making and how you're kind of changing the direction of the company, if at all? Uh, and would and also to follow up on that question, I'm curious if you've made any changes since you've become CEO or done anything differently that's uh, that's leading to to uh, different different results within Cere- Cerebral. Yeah, so. Definitely, the number one thing is doubling down on the clinical quality thesis. Um, And so, uh, as I like to say, the clinicians have taken over and uh, we're really, really being careful on how we make sure that a clinician is involved in every decision that's made across the organization uh, in a major way. And so we have a new clinical liaison model. So even within engineering and product and uh, marketing, every single part of the organization um, is being reviewed by a clinician at, at uh, some level. Um, our NPS score has uh, skyrocketed uh, uh, in the last few months as a result of that and, and other efforts. Um, I would say one major thing that I'm focused on is emphasizing the um, holistic care, meaning adding therapy uh, to care because for depression, as as you know, uh, medications are helpful. Talk therapy is helpful. The combination actually gets patients better faster, and we know that, right? So we should make therapy more available. And so um, recently, we've been able to uh, get uh, therapy available in all fifty states. Um, and as a matter of fact, Forbes uh, uh, rated us as the uh, the number three. Uh, a therapy, a teletherapy uh, company out there in terms of quality. So we're, it's only been a few months, um, but we've made strides. Uh, but to answer that question, it really is putting the focus on clinical quality. Excellent. David, I've really appreciated your candidness and your ability to just speak about this openly. Um, and, uh, I've loved, <laughs> I loved, uh, hearing some of your answers and I've actually got some things that I really want to dig into, especially around this idea of uh, shorter therapy visits. Um, but really great to have you on this podcast. Thank you so much. I know you've got a busy day ahead. Um, thank you for all you're doing for patients, for being engaged within our community, within our health tech community. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to having more talks with you in the future. Well, thanks for having me. This was a a wonderful conversation and uh, looking forward to hearing your other episodes as well. Take care.